Ladies and gentlemen, today marks six months since the horrendous uh, atrocities of the 7th of October. Six months of captivity for the remaining hostages who are always in our thoughts. And six months since the Israeli government tasked the IDF with destroying Hamas as a military force and a governing organisation in the Gaza Strip and rescuing the hostages abducted from Israel. Estimates put the terrorist fighters in Gaza originally at between 40 to 50,000. They had embedded themselves in and around and underneath a population of over 2 million people, mostly in urban centres in a strip of land 40 kilometres long and 10 kilometres wide. Hamas has controlled a network of more than 600 kilometres of tunnels, and reports of it shooting and bombing fleeing civilians have been confirmed by the Israelis and the Americans. We are honoured to be joined by John Spencer to discuss the extraordinary military and legal challenges that have faced the IDF in this territory and its response to them. John Spencer is the Chair of Urban Warfare Studies at the Modern War Institute at West Point and co-director of the Urban Warfare Project. He's a leading expert on urban warfare and a founding member of the International Working Group on Subterranean Warfare. He served over 25 years in the US Army as an infantry soldier, later serving in elite military units, working his way through the ranks to major. After active duty, Spencer served as colonel in the California State Guard with an assignment to the 40th Infantry Division, California Army National Guard, as director of urban warfare planning. He's authored uh, several books, including Understanding Urban Warfare, Connected Soldiers, Life, Leadership and Social Connections in Modern War, and the mini manual for the urban defender. John, it is wonderful to have you with us. You have been a leading voice of reason and clarity, uh, as well as sharing your expertise and your experience more recently on the ground in Gaza. Thank you for joining us. Well, thanks for having me, Natasha. And I've relied a lot on your work on you know, further understanding what is, to some people, a complex, especially the, the law of armed conflict in application in urban combat will really... Um, it many of the restrictions on the use of force come into play. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, please may I ask you to put your questions to John into the Q&A facility and I shall weave them in to our discussion as we go. Uh, but perhaps to start with, uh, John, we are being faced with an unprecedented misinformation storm vis-a-vis -vis Israel's conduct of this war. You have been on the ground in Gaza. Could I start by asking you about your overall impressions of Israel's approach? Well, I I think that the overall impression of the IDF approach, since I've visited multiple times, has been a very methodical um, and surprisingly unique approach to the difficulties of dense urban combat, both in taking away the way the enemy wants to fight you, because you never fight your enemy the way he wants. Uh, so. 15 years of planning that Hamas did um, to coordinate October 7th and to basically have a strategy to win this war and how the IDF have moved forward um, to take that strategy away from them, Every whether it's the enemy Hamas's ability to use their tunnels to try to get civilians killed or, or hurt, um, to get the international media to use every image as some type of effects-based condemnation of the way the IDF approach it. But unique to this war, every time I've visited, I get surprised on, I didn't even think that was possible in the way the IDF have methodically, very discriminately, very directly approached each one of the challenges. And each one of them are, are unique, every, not just the urban combat in a three-dimensional space, but the presence of civilian non-combatants, the difficulty in information operations, the presence of hostages intermixed, the launching of the rockets. I mean, just so many challenges that no military in really ever has ever faced in a war, which again, I think people get confused on 
trying to compare this to other things. This is a war against Hamas that was started on October 7th um, with very clear and definable military objectives. Well, you've certainly come out publicly uh, and forcefully, uh, if I may say so, to state that Israel has uh, created a, a new standard for urban warfare. Um, taking into account the array of challenges that you've outlined, it, it seems certainly the combination of them here is unique and unprecedented. Um, what is it, though, in your analysis that you would say this, this new standard of urban warfare has necessarily been based on? Yeah, I think you'll be familiar, and maybe some of your audience will, with in urban combat, we have, you know, of course, more restrictions on the use of force than any other environment on the planet, really. I mean, in the jungles, in the Arctic, there just won't be as many restrictions on the use of force as because of the law of armed conflict, and especially, you know, distinction and proportionality, all these very clear laws. Um, once you enter the urban environment, there's more restrictions on the military use of force. And there's also requirements to take constant care to protect civilian life, uh, protected populations, protected objects. So when you enter them, it's very difficult. And often, even beyond the law and the legal obligations, militaries will put restrictions on themselves in the forms of rules of engagement and things like that. So when I say a new standard, I'm, I'm mostly talking about civilian harm mitigation, which is a a term that we use to, to say, okay, what beyond the legal requirements, what mitigation steps are you putting in place to prevent civilian casualties, prevent civilian harm? And there's some standards, right? So new standard. There's some standards that all other militaries, to include the United States, have have put in place. There are actually best practices for civilian harm mitigation in both targeting and in operations that were kind of the, the standard, right? There's a handbooks out there before this war. As I visited, though, I saw the IDF not only doing those things, everything from, you know, the targeting process, having a legal advisor in the, the targeting cell, making the proportionality assessments on every strike, but also even in the operations. So like the fact that it's been a standard practice, although not in war, but in certain types of environments to encircle cities and evacuate them of most of the civilian population, that evacuation is you know, pretty much a going standard for the best technique you can do to protect civilian life is to move them out of harm's way, even when they refuse to move out of harm's way. And there's lots of tactics that are used and techniques to help with evacuations, like the practice of dropping flyers. And the IDF have dropped millions of flyers. And that was pretty much the extent before this war of how do you evacuate cities? You encircle them and you, you, um, you drop flyers because it is enemy territory inside the city that's being held by the enemy or the urban area. So, but the IDF, unique to the IDF, in addition to dropping millions of flyers, also made millions of direct phone calls. So putting soldiers in rooms and having them call into numbers that they have for, you know, imams and, and, and leaders and tribal leaders and key persons in the environment saying, we really um, for your safety, please evacuate th this area and move along this route to this area. Yeah. They sent you know millions of text messages, millions of pre-recorded voice messages to everybody's cell phones, and that's and those are all new standards. Mm -hmm. And but they also waited for operations. So you know, unique to of course, if you do all of this, you have to give time for civilians to leave. You have to provide the safe route. You have to have an area where you want them to go. Israel waited three weeks before the ground invasion started, even though the hostages over 240 were taken and in, 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 in captivity. So they 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 waited. As the war progressed, though, the world for some reason said, it's not enough. What you're doing is not enough. You have to do more. And not because of that condemnation, but because the IDF is a moral force that not only follows the legal requirements to take constant care, but also is a moral force. So they developed new ways like handing out their maps, um, which is what they did, you know, going into, you know, further into the combat, they started handing out their maps, which I teach soldiers how to develop to control their forces. But the IDF decided to give those maps to the civilians, which in turn goes to Hamas and, and tell Hamas and the civilians exactly where they're going to be every day and do localized 
evacuations on top of since the beginning of the war doing daily pauses um four hour pauses at sometimes at random times or at predictable times so evacuations could continue which is unique as well to do daily pauses during a battle a high intensity combat battle um so that evolved now they're using technologies they also deployed drones with speakers and airdrop speakers from parachutes now they're using technology to track cell phone presence um aerial I mean, footage to track cell phone presence is that specifically to, to gauge where civilians are um, in the vicinity of strikes right, right. Um, sorry carry on and then, and lastly i i know that was long uh, it's just been a lot of measures uh yeah. The new, basically, they stood up a civilian harm mitigation cell with a one-star general in charge of it, um, who's incorporated into operation and produces a live map for the idea, which shows where the civilians are, even when they've been told to evacuate. And they're not authorized to go into those areas without either prime minister or chief of staff of the military's permission, even if there's, you know, contact or operations happening in those areas because it's kind of normal the standard is to identify all the objects in the environment whether it's a protected site or just a sensitive site and mark all those no fire areas but now they're using this live map and the population tracking to didn't drive also that's a restricted zone you can't go in there without conducting permissions or other um, steps before entering that area so just to map out for our audience, then we're, we're talking about layers, as it were, of um, law operational practice and then um, the sort of unprecedented steps that you're describing. So at a basic level, in terms of the law of armed conflict, um, those principles that I think many in our audience will already now be familiar with, uh, the principles of necessity, distinction, uh, uh, proportionality, of course, which I'd love to come on to discuss in some more detail in due course, and precaution. And it's in the context of that principle of precaution that really all of the measures that you're setting out, uh, mitigating harm to civilians, trying to evacuate them from these areas, uh, fall. But as you've indicated, that goes not just above previous practice, but above uh, the standards set down, they are minimal standards in international humanitarian law. But of course, that law was developed uh, over a lot of time to regulate primarily law abiding armies fighting each other. And so in this context, the methods, procedures, standards that Israel's developed are for uh, somewhat unusual uh, it seems in many respects unprecedented sort of armed conflict that Israel uh, has had forced upon it. Um, and in that context, the uh, the standard operating procedures, the rules of engagement, I mean, they're not something that Israel routinely publishes, uh, for good reason, some may say, because that gives uh, the enemies a, a degree of insight into its approach, which, which would not be appropriate. But if you had a sense of how uh, the Israeli army standard operating procedures and rules of engagement compare with other law abiding armies, such as the British army and the United States? Yeah, I, I would say that they're more restrictive than the US military and the in allies and others in past wars. Such as the fact is that example, as I, I told you where it, military forces always had the right of self-defense. That's always a part of the, the rules of engagement. Like, look, you know, here are the kind of restrictions on the use of force, whether it's fires um, in the process for that or just responding to enemy contact. You always had the right of self-defense. But based on some of those rules of engagement, there are cases where, like I said, where you can't even go into that area, even if you're taking fire without an extra level of permissions, which is that standard operating procedure or rules of engagement layer on top of which people get confused, um, which I, I hope we can talk about, too, is. You know, even as I've seen people who don't understand war, don't understand the legal aspects of war and say things like, you know, uh, somebody has to be carrying a weapon to be considered a combat. That's not that's not the way the law says. That's not how it works. Um, and and unique again to Hamas, which is a difficulty again with people carrying forward a counterterrorism or counterinsurgency approach is that what I saw on the ground is Hamas reverse engineered every law of war or legal obligation there is and try to use it to their advantage, such as, you know, we, we can talk about the hot, you know, every protected site basically being a military um, site as in the, for the use of lawfare 
And I used to say they built all their tunnels and all their military headquarters and everything underneath all the hospitals, schools, UN buildings. And from my visits, I found that in some cases, no, what they did was build their military infrastructure and then put a school or a mosque or something on top of it, which is unique. But even the practice of like, okay, what what classifies a combatant or a non-combatant? If the enemy who is a combatant is putting caches all across the area so that he can pick up a weapon. He's in civilians, not wearing, you know, not distinguishing himself as required by the law of armed conflict. Not that they follow any rules, but purposely you're wearing civilians, engaging in hostilities, putting the weapon down and then moving out of the building and moving to a different cache where they can pick up a different weapon so that in the in between they're not carrying a weapon. So they're in they're wearing civilians so they can make it very difficult to identify whether they're a combatant or not. And arguably the consequences of this approach for Israel, for the IDF, have been costly. Uh, Israeli casualties have passed uh, 600. Um, there were four fatalities announced this morning after troops were attacked from uh, within a Hamas tunnel. Um, all of this, though, um, certainly from, from my assessment of the legal framework, uh, it shows that this standard is is not so much based on the requirements of international humanitarian law, but on the ethical code of the IDF uh, and the approach that individual soldiers take. And I, I just want to pick up on this point briefly with you, because I appreciate you have engaged now with many officers from the IDF. And I would love a sense of what your impression has been from them, certainly mine. Um, I've I've had a, an abiding impression that every single soldier takes those responsibilities extremely seriously. And when making decisions in what has to be uh, acknowledged is an environment in many cases of chaos and confusion, when making those decisions, ultimately any officer on the ground is conducting themselves uh, and having to, to make calls as a human being rather than just a soldier. Israel's army is a conscription army uh, and the vast majority of those on the ground in Gaza have jobs outside of the military, families uh, to get back to, and they'll have to live with the consequences of their decisions. Have you seen the impact of that on the decision-making process and, and the standards which with which individual soldiers are uh, concerning themselves? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. As I, even on my last trip, I interviewed everybody from the prime minister, the Southern Command commander, the division commander, INCON units, brigade commanders, battalion commanders, and actual individual soldiers. Um, and the overwhelming sentiment was the protection of civilian life, the target only military targets. Um, really, I mean, an, an overwhelming feeling, but also an acknowledgement that the world believes what is not happening, that somehow that somebody is purposely targeting civilians. And, and that's the overall sentiment that even beyond, like you said, beyond all the legal requirements and all the rules of engagement is we absolutely do everything humanly possible. Although I know the legal framework was, is feasibly possible um, based on the military advantage, but th they're doing everything humanly possible in the friction and fog of war in the, somebody is trying to kill you to include taking immense risks to themselves to not make a mistake and have a non-combatant loss of life. Um, that was the overwhelming feeling, even from you know, warriors. I mean, I, I served as an infantryman. So I'm talking to, I mean, the 98th Division commander used to, is, a, is an Israeli Navy SEAL. I mean, he is a warrior. Um, and his overwhelming sentiment was, look, look, this is what my guidance is. Absolutely positive identification of enemy combatant, positively identifying hostile and, you know, activity, everything. And, and the steps that they've taken walking through the day-to-day -day operations and walking the ground with him is that I was really amazed at that overwhelming, of course, we're going to close with and destroy the enemy, but the overwhelming sentiment, not at the cost of any civilian lives. Well, that seems like an appropriate time to, to bring up the, the latest um, new story, if you will, and this tragedy concerning the world central kitchen work. Um, Peter Lerner uh, has issued a, a statement indicating um, 
well, in his words, I think that the true strength of the IDF lies in the humility to acknowledge errors uh, and the uh, courage to make amends and the resolve to learn from them. Uh, and certainly in the context of this independent investigation into this tragic incident, uh, led by Major General of the Reserves, uh, Yoav Ha Evan, into this killing of, of seven World Kitchen workers uh, in Gaza, that that was presented to the Chief of Staff, um, Hertzi Khalevi, uh, and the investigation concluded that the attack um, that, that caused those deaths was a grave mistake, uh, resulting from incorrect identification uh, and decision-making uh, and non-compliance with um, the uh, SOPs. There have been, of course, um, several dismissals. Uh, the uh, fire support commander, a major, the uh, brigade chief of staff, a colonel in the reserves, um, and also formal reprimands for the uh, brigade commander, who's a colonel, the division commander, brigadier general, and the southern uh, command commander, who is a major general. Um, so those sorts of measures are perhaps uh, unprecedented. And yet we have seen... Uh, so much criticism levied at Israel, including from Ian Bremer, who I know that you've uh, personally responded to, uh, and his suggestion that the IDF knew that they were targeting aid workers. What do you make of this disconnect between what the realities that you've just described and the way this particular incident is being uh, reported on and uh, criticised? I mean, it's just another series of unfortunate events where I see people who are experts in one field providing analysis without the information, um, like a belief of, it's my opinion that based on what I'm seeing, this is what happened. Despite Israel, immediate investigation, which is, again, unique, the speed of the investigation, the speed of taking ownership for an action, and their explanation to include detailed information of what happened. And then you still have somebody like Ian Brimmer, I don't know him personally, saying, based on my assessment, clearly they knew that they were going to kill world, literally specifically, exactly knew that it was world central kitchen personnel. They knew that they would kill them to get to one combatant. And that is such a gross example of somebody not understanding what happened or not trusting or not even trying to get to the point of your assessment based on none of the information is, is dangerously, I don't want to say what I usually do, uh, dangerously ignorant, let's say, uh, of the way it works, what happened, um, and a strong belief that Israel is intentional in, in the loss of life. I mean, to, to, to go as far as to say, like they knew exactly who it was and they intentionally took the, the strike is, is just gross. I mean, in my personal opinion, but this is, I mean, the fact that the mistakes happen in war, every military, no matter what steps they put in, has made very similar, if not much worse mistakes, even when they're being criticized for every action they take. Uh, I mean, there's a long list of example. And this is a horrific tragedy that Israel immediately took responsibility to, which is unique. Usually it said, okay, we'll look into it. You know, we'll do an investigation on what happened. Um, but understood that you'd have people with positions of responsibility, to be honest. I mean, some of these voices who are in like academic institutions or or in political in government, like there's a responsibility not to say dumb things, um, which are dangerous for not just Israel, but for everybody, that people are going to believe your interpretation means you have some access to information that nobody else does, and your assumptions get, can get people killed, to be honest. Well, in fairness, we've, we've had similar um, similar expressions of uh, and, and comments with respect to the, the legal position, uh, and prominent lawyers have sought to justify their assessment of alleged genocide on the basis of what they see on the television. So uh, it, it's not just those individuals that, that you're calling out, but but clearly the response of Israel to this incident um, has been unusual in the context in which you've described. If one thinks back to, uh, I think it was in 2021, with the withdrawal of US forces uh, from Afghanistan, the drone strike, which very tragically killed 
um, not just an aid worker, but but his family, the, the response of the American military was perhaps quite different to uh, the immediate investigation and acceptance of responsibility that we've seen from the IDF. And um, in your experience, what sort of levels of, of friendly fire, a terrible term, I, I, I acknowledge, um, but that concept of friendly fire, I mean, that's consistent throughout armed conflict. We've, we've seen terrible incidents, even with respect to the British armed forces in the Falklands, which was a, a very different terrain from the one that Israel is encountering in Gaza. Uh, is there a, an average in terms of uh, incidents of friendly fire that uh, law abiding armies nevertheless have to contend with? So, no, there's not. And one, it would be, again, this is the world we live in where somebody wants to take a number, a percentage, and then compare it, whether it's munitions used, destruction caused, civilian casualties. It's, um, a lot of it is literally, there's a great book called Lies, Damn Lies, and Statistics. It's just not a humorous title, but it actually goes into how statistics can be warped. So to compare Israel's friendly fire incidents to other any other battle, event, whatever, would be comparing apples to oranges. But really, you'd have to go back to any similar battles, although this isn't a battle. This is a war with multiple battles of such urban density, which we call the great equalizer, because no matter what your technology is, no matter how good you are, the urban terrain equalizes. And the complexity of it, the fact that you can't see around the block, um, increases the difficulty. And then the, the fact that the enemy is underground, which is very unique to this war. Um, it, there are, of course, always friendly fire incidents, no matter what you do to prevent them. And But this is, I think, the number of friendly fire incidents in the IDF is, is not a, so this again gets to who's interpreting the information, um, is a sign to me, having been there, seeing the complexity of just the surface terrain, the 10 story skyscrapers, the, the, in, the high density of building structures, let alone the underground networks of 400 miles of tunnels where just like you said today, an enemy combatant, despite having such control over the terrain, was able to pop up in a hole nobody knew was there, fire an RPG at the IDF, and then escape back into his tunnel, because this is literally like it's a city underneath the city. So is it abnormally high, given the context of the battle and the intensity of the battle and the density of the urban terrain, the tactics of the enemy? No. You do everything you can to prevent a single loss uh, uh, from friendly fire because one, just like when a soldier makes a mistake like we were talking about, it, it leaves a, to be honest, a moral injury on the soldiers who are are moral people of value that don't want to make those type of mistakes and it leaves a, a really bad scar on them if if they are involved in such a mistake. Um, it, for, as an old soldier, it, it kind of hurts me to think about it. Um, John, John, you've mentioned the tunnels a few times. We've had so many questions vis-a-vis uh, -vis the tunnels and what that entails for Israel's strategic approach here, uh, in particular, whether there's any way that the IDF can seek to successfully destroy that network of tunnels. Do you have any particular insights from, from your background in other conflicts? Well, from my studies, I wouldn't say from my background or my yeah, or other context because there hasn't been one. Yeah, sure. right. Um, as like you said, I'm a I'm a founding member of the International um, Subterranean Working Group, uh, which we've done conferences. I've been in Hezbollah tunnels in the north. I've been in Hamas tunnels in the south. Um, one, I wrote an article that that is the strategy. So unique to this war, where the surface isn't the priority, it is the subterranean. The underground means more to the enemy than the surface does, because you have to look at a war based on both sides' strategy. Hamas's strategy is not to um, they do use the tunnels, like we saw, to, for offensive and defensive capabilities to pop up and use these guerrilla tactics of hit and run tactics and survive aerial bombardment, all these things. But their entire infrastructure or subterranean is meant to fulfill their strategy, which is just to survive the war, to make it take a lot of time and to survive the war. Uh, you know, the ability to destroy the tunnel, since that is one of the three objectives of Israel, is to 
to destroy Hamas and its military capability, which includes the tunnels. And what what the IDF have found have surprised the world, all of us. It, it surprised the IDF. It surprised me as a as a scholar of underground warfare that nobody thought that they could dig tunnels under rivers. They could um, have massive weapons manufacturing, rocket manufacturing plants 200 feet underground with chemicals and everything. The So the question is, can you destroy that effectively? One, you'd have to find it all. Um, and as, again, like events said, like today, and what I saw on the ground is that it, people think it might be easy to find tunnel shafts. And they found, they found a I think, over 1,500 shafts in just northern Gaza. Um, the time that that takes to do that. And if you can find it, and then, okay, how do you destroy it, right? Because usually in military parlance, it's explosive force that destroys the tunnel. Even if you were try to do like in the North, which you would run out of concrete and just fill it full of wet concrete, there's not enough in the world to, to fill 400 miles of tunnels. So you've got to use a lot of explosive force as in, you know, liquid or or mines strung together, and, th and they are methodically doing that, but they're having to basically decide what tunnels they are going to destroy. Um, so they have methodically done that, especially a lot of the strategic tunnels and the bigger tunnels. Um, but it, this is why even when Hamas military is destroyed, there's still going to be a, a lot of work to destroy its infrastructure. And that includes its tunnels that still has to be done. Is it possible to destroy them all? Unlikely. Is it just possible to, just, to destroy a very high level of it? Yes. Um, John, I have to say, we have a completely unprecedented number of questions from the audience. Um, I see that. Because, perhaps because it is uh, an extremely large audience, but I think also testament to how little information there is uh, out there and in terms of the discussions, but also the media coverage of the realities of, of armed conflict. Um, I'm going to try and group as many of them together as possible and, and try and cover yeah. as many of these areas. Um, in particular, bearing in mind all of this criticism that we've already discussed, have you ever been presented with practical suggestions of what Israel can be doing um, on a on, on the ground uh, in order to minimize damage to civilians in the present situation uh, where Hamas is is constantly intermingling with the civilian population or, or even moving the civilian population away? I mean, are there any practical suggestions or is it just criticism that you've been hearing? Oh, I've only heard criticism um, because any suggestion. So we have these terms that we use for different courses of action in the military, such as the fact that they have to be feasible, they have to be suitable, they have to be acceptable to the goals that you're you're trying to achieve. All uh, and, and like I said, every time I've gone and I teach, I'm not the only, you know, I, I don't want to sound um, awful when I say it, but you know, I teach division level urban warfare. I've been studying it for 10 years. And if you would have asked me on day one, did I have suggestions? Of course I had suggestions. Um, did I, when I went into Khan Yunus though, I saw things that, that have never been done, uh, new ways to surprise the enemy without harming civilians in dense urban combat. Um, like even in Khan Yunus, they surrounded an urban area rather than just emptying the city. They surrounded it without a shot being fired and then asked the civilians to pass through their own lines, which is very risky pass through the IDF's line so they could use facial recognition and things to get to the Hamas combatants wearing civilians, trying to just move around with the civilian um, personnel that are being temporarily evacuated. The suggestions that I have heard, and I've written about this, that started on October 8th, was that Israel should not go in on the ground, on the ground should not do a ground invasion, and they should do targeted raids and precision strikes what they call surgical strikes well one that you know if you look at the goals of the idf there are so many assumptions and one of them is time time is always a factor in war like the fact that the idf waited three weeks before starting the ground invasion and in that three weeks there was an assumption at the national level that we were going to leave our captivity our, our hostages in captivity where awful things were happening to them while that was happening, while it's that trade-off, and this is why it's, you know, it is a legal, it is a subjective decision when people want it to be a quantitative decision, right? They want it to be an objective decision, which is 
in, as you know, the human rights world, not the human international humanitarian law, the human rights world is, well, just don't do the operation. That's the suggestion. Just wait. You know, wait until you have 100% of civilians evacuated. Wait until the rockets you, you are at a level where you, you can stop all the rockets, right? So just don't do the operation, which is maybe we'll talk about Southern Gaza and Rafa. Like one of the alternatives is just don't do it. Pursue another strategy, which I'll be at, I, we all understand, and people literally wrote it in print in the Wall Street Journal, like, you should change your strategy to achieve your goals. Yes, it will take you years to do, but it's a better way, which I strongly disagree with. Well, well in terms of Southern Gaza, and we've had a couple of questions on very recent developments, um, Prime Minister Netanyahu indicated uh, this afternoon that 19 out of the 24 Hamas battalions had been eliminated. Um, but that uh, mostly the IDF were withdrawing from the south of Gaza. D does that, in the context of what you know and what you've seen on the ground, what does that say to you about where the operation may be moving and what the prospects are for the IDF um, continuing, uh, as Netanyahu has stated repeatedly, that they will be entering Rafa to complete uh, the mission to fulfill the war aims of the destruction of Hamas. I mean, where do you think that leaves the IDF? And is it possible to destroy Hamas without uh, completing the operation in, in, in Rafa? No, not given if you if people would agree that time is not indefinite and time is never indefinite in war, especially when war is a contest of will to include with international will. Um, that the, the war should continue. Um, the only hurdle to preventing the civilian loss of life in the, the humanitarian crisis is the fact that the job is that Hamas refuses to surrender, which is a cognitive thing. And I know that we share a, a book on the Clausewitz is that it is a contest of will. Um, and, it's, and this is again, the history of urban combat. When you're combatant, the enemy force cannot be convinced that it is futile to resist and, and can't won't surrender and will die to the death. And that wasn't included in clause with the book um, when you have to take their will away from them. I personally think, yes, I understand. I've seen the transition, which for me as a military strategist means that in the that area, especially Khan Yunus, the IDF have been successful at destroying the coherent military organizations and done a massive amount of the clearing to include the destruction of tunnels in that area and are able to transition to continue operations somewhere else. Um, this is, I, I think, well, along with those statements, although it, it you know, depending on how you spin the headline, um, you know, withdrawn from Gaza. Well, they, they've completed operations like they did in northern Gaza, in, in central and the northern part of, of southern Gaza, but they still say, and I believe them, that they're going to go into finish the four remaining battalions. I personally, with no affiliation, do not believe the idea of Israel can accomplish its war game, war aims in a reasonable amount of time without entering Rafa. But I do strongly believe, based on my research, especially in Khan Yunus, that they can do it with minimizing civilian casualties to a historically low level, as in moving civilians out of harm's way while still targeting the enemy forces and retrieving their hostages and bringing them home. Um, in terms of evacuating the civilian population, I might just add that, that there is international law on this and Egypt's obligations uh, under the treaty that it has signed the African Union Convention on Refugees, which is acceded to in 1980, uh, makes clear its obligations uh, to facilitate the entry of civilians fleeing civil disorder. Um, and I, I mean, one can just think of the situation of those civilians being able to actually uh, evacuate, be provided with humanitarian assistance, the other side of the uh, Egypt-Gaza border in Egyptian Rafa. Uh, what a different scenario that would paint and how uh, that would necessarily ease Israel's operation against Hamas, but no doubt also hasten the end uh, of, of this uh, awful war, um, rather than with the call for a, a ceasefire, as we've seen uh, so frequently. May I just briefly pick up that that question of immediate ceasefire um, and ask whether you have any particular thoughts on it? Because certainly, from the, from the perspective over here, it sounds, and we've heard it, uh, it reiterated even by the prime minister, unfortunately, in a in a press release this morning, 
Um, it sounds as though it's exactly what Hamas is after. It's handing a victory to Hamas, which is essentially seeking only at this juncture to survive, uh, and an immediate ceasefire that allows Hamas uh, to continue in the Gaza Strip um, would, would be it completing its outcome. Do, do you see any different perspective on that? Or no, no a, a, a permanent ceasefire. And there are some differences, and it's interesting how different people will use the word differently. Um, and, and words matter. Ceasefire means I'm going to stop for now. Um, and there's other terms, even legally, that, that mean something long term. Um, but if somebody believes ceasefire now means stop all combat operations indefinitely, then that is a Hamas victory. That, that's what that means. That means even if Hamas gave all the hostages back, which I was very supportive of the temporary ceasefire that happened earlier that did bring through military pressure half of the hostages back. Um, but if you ceasefire, in my personal opinion now, and by definition of those who want all the war to stop, want all wars around the world to stop, and want the suffering to stop, that means Hamas achieves a, a strategic victory. They have met their war objective of just surviving the war. Um, and that is that includes just that top 10%. And just to pick up on what I think is a very important observation, that initial humanitarian pause, which facilitated the release of hostages, that, that was achieved um, because of the intense military pressure on Hamas. And everything that we've seen subsequently, uh, giving Hamas encouragement, is, is pushing a, a possible second um, negotiated uh, exchange of unfortunately, terrorist prisoners uh, for the hostages that Hamas is holding on to, because rather than Israel being allowed to maintain that constant military pressure on Hamas, uh, it is being encouraged uh, to withstand, um, uh, to, to continue um, at, to prolong this conflict by the sort of international pressure on Israel that we've been discussing. Um, and one thing too, I think people felt, uh, well, I would absolutely, I mean, that is the number one priority is bring the hostages home. And I would be a supportive of another temporary pause. But this gets to, and I, I don't usually like to talk about ongoing negotiation of the terms, but if anybody you know, would say, you know, Israel also has to think about its national survival and the survival of all citizens. And if Hamas survives the war, that leads to a much more violent world in general, more October 7th, everything. And, and people would need to recognize what happened during the last temporary pause and the immense military disadvantage that Israel was willing to do um, to include... Um, which nobody talks about, that during that temporary ceasefire, Hamas pushed civilians into uncleared areas like Khan Yunus and increased the population by 300%, which led to the difficulty in the pace of that operation. And they still kept civilian casualties to a historic low. But if Hamas survives, victory. Um, a number of questions here uh, about... Uh, hospitals, and I know that you have written um, pretty extensively about the operation in Al Shifa. Um, is this another example of, of of an unprecedented? Now, there were, of course, two stages to this. Perhaps you could talk our audience through those. But the more recent um, uh, military operation uh, around the Al Shifa hospital complex involved uh, killing hundreds of uh, terrorist operatives and apprehending hundreds more. Uh, what was your assessment of the way that Israel managed that very, very difficult environment? Uh, my assessment was was of surprise and in, in the uniqueness uh, to the operation, uh, especially comparing the two different operations of Al-Shifa from the beginning of the war on, on to, the, to the second time, when they were able to use surprise to... Um, encircle, evacuate um, the hospital with that size of an enemy force using the hospital for military purpose, war crime. And you're right, I did write about that in extensive detail because it, it's really surprising. I know it probably surprises you, the ignorance of the world, even about the protections of a hospital, which are multi-layered um, and what the legal responsibilities are of the attacking force when they are approaching a protected site, which is to notify the enemy to stop using that site, a protected to making it lose its protection, like stop that, leave it. Um, but this operation, which is um, people for some reason didn't like me calling it the Battle of Al Shifa Hospital, but that's what it was when you had a thousand combatants inside the hospital refusing to leave. And the IDF were able to 
safely get all the civilians out of harm's way, bring in their own doctors to service patients who couldn't evacuate, bring in food, water, everything, while they're having a battle on a different floor of the hospital. Um, and, and like you said, to, to eliminate 200 Hamas terrorists and capture hundreds of others, and the only comment that is made in the national news is the damage caused to the hospital buildings that was caused by the combatants using the hospital um, who wouldn't even leave the hospital when when told to. Um, quite a few questions asking about Israel's conduct in the present war uh, compared with uh, past actions. Uh, past actions of the United uh, of the United Kingdom, forgive me, in Northern Ireland, uh, and also the Allied forces in in Iraq and Afghanistan. I fear that is a discussion in and of itself for for another hour and a half. But do you have any remarks that you'd be able to to give us in summary of, of looking at examples like that and and what Israel is contending with here? Sure. I mean, I think that my overwhelming comment is don't compare apples to oranges. E um, Hamas is the ruling power of an enemy hostile environment. That is separate than a semi-permissive environment in which a country fights a counterinsurgency or counterterrorism campaign, either with host nation support or without it. It's literally comparing war to stability operations, war to counterinsurgencies. Like in order to be classified as an insurgent, there has to be a host nation force in which that insurgent is resisting, not, not you as in the military there. And this is the idea, like if for me as a U.S. military veteran, you want to compare it against Iraq and Afghanistan, you can only compare it against the opening weeks when either the Taliban or the Saddam regime was the ruling power with militaries. Hamas is a military, and I, I think um, you and I share, um, you know, trying to help people understand that by calling it a terror military, because they're also a military that follows that uses terrorism as a tactic. But it was until Hamas is removed, Israel is not fighting a counterinsurgency in Gaza. It's not finding a counterterrorism campaign. Those are very large fields of studies, which are um, very long histories of what works and what doesn't work. And yes, after Hamas is removed as the governing power, then you could say you're entering a counterterrorism, counterinsurgency campaign. And there are a lot of lessons from Northern Ireland, Iraq, Afghanistan, in that phase of the operation that would apply to how you separate the insurgent and the terrorists from the civilians and how do you identify them with intelligence and what it takes and the amount of time and the security um, and the, you know, the, all of the steps in post-conflict resolution, everything that get applied. A few questions I'm going to try and pull together um, relating to allowing journalists into Gaza, but also UN staff, um, uh, whether or not they can feasibly uh, be in a better position to protect the civilian population. Uh, I know that you've been on the ground there, uh, and so you have a better sense of it than than I think any, any well, most people certainly commentating on this. Do you have a sense that it, it's possible to allow a greater international um, press presence uh, and what possible role could international organizations like the United Nations play given the kind of intense fighting that we're still seeing uh, play out even six months into this? Yeah, that's really complex. I really wish at the beginning of this, a lot of our multinational organizations like the United Nations and all their subordinate organizations would have taken a strong stance to condemn Hamas for October 7th actions and to tell them to release the hostages at the start of any briefing or any policy position. And then um, to put the onus of everything happening on God, in Gaza to Hamas. Because if Hamas would have given the hostages back and surrendered after that attack, none of the, the, the war would be over. It could be over tomorrow if that was the case. But you don't hear... Um, it, it's a long conversation. Uh, on the media coverage, right? On the journalists coverage because this is what people fear what they don't know they take they take tiktok videos and piece them together to make some type of report um, and then they'll add reports or they take the word of hamas it's very problematic um, of course there's always more that can be done but they people also carry forward environments of the past which isn't this this is a total combat situation 
where the there are it's a war environment. So any journalist that is freely there, that's really what they want. Um, there have been journalists who have been where the IDF or the force that's in the combat takes an ownership of protection over the journalist. So that's the, you know the media embed concept. That means that the 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 other the military who follows the law of war usually um, is providing protection if they get brought in, and that has happened in the IDF. Could you say it could be, could have happened more? Absolutely, um, but you could also say that there's some um, a uniqueness to when even when the IDF did bring international media in, then they were accused of um, controlling what they had access to or something like that, rather than just being able to walk off into the into the combat zone in which the, again, the IDF is accused of targeting journalists who are self going into war zones and putting themselves at risk um, or embedding with Hamas, which is unique or using the protection of journalism and press on the other side that Hamas has valid, you know, probably not argued by the rest of the world, use that to include terrorists wearing press credentials in order to say that Israel, in order to fulfill this information operation strategy to say that Israel is targeting journalists, aid workers, or civilians, which even the United States in all of its assessments say there's not one case of evidence of Israel targeting journalists, aid workers, or civilians. And that was last week. Um, so it's really complex on how can journalists get access to a war zone in which there is a side who doesn't follow the laws of war? Because yes, absolutely, they could have embedded with Hamas, and then Hamas would have taken ownership for protecting them in the war zone. Uh, you know, God forbid what they would do to uh, some of the journalists based on their 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 history of what they do to people in general. Um, we've had a couple of questions about the classification of this conflict, um, specifically between. Uh, a NIAC, non-international armed conflict, and an IAC, international armed conflict. And, and certainly there have been commentators, uh, it seems, falling on both sides uh, of that divide. In particular, certain international organizations uh, seem to, to switch um, on, on a daily basis as to how they're analyzing this. Um, a case in point might be the ICRC. Uh, and it's true that um, the general provisions of international law under the Geneva Conventions for for a non-international armed conflict uh, will be potentially lesser. I mean, we've seen that in the context of the uh, status that detainees in the context of um, this non-international armed conflict, if we're classing it in that way, uh, that's crossed, certainly crossed a border. Um, the, these are somewhat unusual instances uh, and and perhaps that contributes to the difficulty in terms of classification. Um, but what's clear is that the general principles of IHL in terms of those that we've already discussed, uh, distinction, necessity and proportionality uh, would, would still apply in whichever category we're looking at. And I promise I wanted to come back to proportionality because I do think from a from a legal perspective, it is the most misrepresented um, principle of international law in the history of international law. Uh, and so much of it ultimately comes down to that balancing exercise that ordinary military commanders are expected to undertake. And so many questions have been, you know, okay, well, what, what would be proportionate or what would be disproportionate and what are the numbers involved? What, what's your assessment of how proportionality is best applied on the ground, you know, in the context of um, strike by strike decisions or decisions having to be made in the heat of the moment? And do you have a sense of Israel's approach uh, to the principle of proportionality itself. So that's a lot. Um, the big question. Sorry. Yeah, I really appreciated your video, and if anybody hasn't watched it about the ICRC's um, comments and about an IAC, IAC, and illegal combatants, detainees, that was a really great, informative video. And I think that we we probably should do another one to, I guess, remind the world what proportionality means, uh, especially when you're talking about the law of war proportionality, because even again, smart people that are really dumb on proportionality, like the fact that people believe the, the tragic loss of life on October 7th, the 1200 um, casualties in Israel from Hamas's illegal invasion, all like more war crimes that can be listed happening on October 7th. 
that that number has anything to do to the proportionality of what the war aims are in Gaza. That somehow they, they compare a body count on October 7th to anything else, whether it's the unfortunate loss of civilian life in the war, which despite Israel taking every step to minimize it. How does proportionality work um, beyond um, the actual overall proportionality as in waging war against Hamas to remove the imminent threat to Israel's survival and attacks on Israel and what it takes, the proportional force to stop those attacks, to return the hostages, to eliminate Hamas. That's proportionality. And then on the day-to-day, -day, like you were talking about, that's the other aspect of whether it's a, a strike, a, both planned or dynamic strike, like you, you mentioned, and what the requirement is, which is very clear. It's actually not as subjective as people that don't know what they're talking about try to make it. It's very clear that it is a very detailed calculation that is at the, like you said, the core of the law of war is that a law abiding force is making a conscious decision based on the information they have at the moment. All the intelligence they have, all the information they have is that they are only engaged in a military target. And once they are, they make a calculation on the military advantage or value of that target known or expected collateral damage and they did do that calculation and then this is some ideal again which is probably the great, greatest travesty of any war is that somebody looks at the effects of the war especially an urban battle and says well look at the damage that means you clearly are disproportionate it doesn't matter what you say you knew at the time based on what i'm seeing based on the number of civilian casualties you're clearly according to all these experts, being disproportionate and accepting a higher level of collateral damage in your proportionality assessments. By, and they literally say, I assume. And you know, I found somebody who says, no, no, you're, you're accepting a higher level of collateral damage than, than anybody else has. Well, one, you, what's the military mission advantage value of survival? Well, you're right. But this is all consistently on an effects-based analysis, right. whereas international law is clear that it's it's based on the intention. And when one considers, I think, the relative uh, intelligence position of Israel vis-a-vis -vis Gaza, um, that those are going to be even more informed decisions right. uh, than perhaps in in, in other um, theatres or, or in other territories. Um, there are quite a few allegations vis-a-vis -vis this uh, proportionality exercise and strike selection that the inclusion of artificial intelligence um, is something that uh, should be criticised. Now, I think Israel has been pretty clear that these allegations are unfounded and um, constitute further misinformation about how it approaches that. But do you have any insight into how AI uh, might have featured I have no other insight than actually the words that the I, Israel and the IDF have stated, despite really, you know, Churchill's statement in reality is doesn't, you know, a lie can travel the world before the truth puts its pants on. That That is what ha has happened with this first 976 and then Telegraph and then the CNN running unfounded, unaccredited reports from unnamed sources within the IDF who tried to explain what the artificial intelligence database that's being used, Lavender or another one by the IDF, who had immediately put out a statement that nobody wants to read on, actually, that's 100% false. And it, what you're saying that this system is used to make targeting decisions. And it, in, what they infer, again, is that there's an, they have accepted a higher level of collateral damage even in the calculations and that humans are just rubber stamping the AI's decision with a lower collateral damage. It's absolutely, according to Israel, which I trust, um, official communication, especially based on presidents that even when they make his, a mistake, they they let the world know, who says, 100% I'm saying this technology is used to collate intelligence to actually make it a more informed decision. Like we were talking about in proportionality. It's like you gather all the information you have at hand and they're using a database collector of, that uses artificial intelligence to assist in intelligence gathering that does not mark, okay, you can you can attack this target. John, we're coming to the end of our time together, I'm afraid. I think we could spend certainly a day uh, seminar going through the detail of this. So many of the questions 
um, that have been coming in based on on what you have been saying are, are incredulous uh, and cannot understand why there aren't more people speaking out and how there can be such a disconnect between what they are hearing here uh, and and have been, I think, for, for a number of weeks, if not months, from you and the sort of criticism uh, that we've had, including from the United States. And actually, I include in that um, comments that I recall John Kirby uh, announcing right at the outset of this operation, a, a military man, um, a uh, retired United States um, Navy Rear Admiral who uh, was on the record saying that the appropriate number of civilian casualties in this operation would be zero. Is there anything that you can help uh, with to enable our audience to understand finally this disconnect, this criticism, um, the hypocrisy, if you will, in, in when one considers the track records of other law abiding armies that are now criticizing Israel? How can we properly comprehend and understand what it is that the IDF is up against here in terms of this PR wall uh, that Hamas is certainly waging? Yeah, it's hard hard to explain. Um, you know, I try to go back to like the great military theorist and try to make people understand that, look, all war is politics. And in the geopolitical world that we live in, everything's connected. And there are many, many stakeholders of a single statement. And that even if you have a spokesman for an administration, it's not their personal thoughts they're providing. They're providing that government's, that administration's viewpoint at the moment based on all political considerations. And, and especially in democracies where the 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 will of the people definitely factor into it, the, the opinion. And unfortunately, the court of public opinion does matter in any war, especially in a war where Israel is involved. How to understand, even when you have an expert in something, uh, and I don't, again, want to sound brash, but there are few people in the world who actually understand the challenges in which the idea faced in Gaza or understand the complete history of any like situation, what is the realm of possible to achieve Israel's goal, even if they believe that Israel has the right to pursue those goals. There are a lot of people who have lived, even who have been in the military for 40 years, who have no study of like situations and then can make a, an advice, an analysis of one is, is Israel following all the laws of war? Would anybody else do it differently? And I, I strongly believe no, uh, even within all the frameworks outside of the groups, which you and I contend against, who have gained legitimacy because of their organizations. They've gained a voice because of the cause to push human rights agendas to believe that all wars should not be around no civilian zero civilian deaths should be the goal when that is not the reality of war it never has been and in my opinion never will be you do everything feasible reasonable and even humanly possible to limit the loss of civilian non-combatant lives but in urban combat there's no other area where it is more difficult and of course, the corollary of, of what you're describing is that it's not just handling potentially Hamas victory in this context, but redrawing the, the, the map for the fight that other Western liberal democratic states are going to have to contend with vis-a-vis with, -vis similar terrorist organizations. So um, that the damage here is, is not just uh, potentially restricted to Israel, but but to essentially all of uh, us uh, in the West that are having to contend with th this onslaught on, on our way of life. Um, John, I'm, I'm so tremendously grateful. And, and, and also, I have to say that level of questions and audience participation here has been utterly unprecedented. And I hope that you take from that that your contribution to this is beyond valuable and it's so important that you do as many of these as possible uh, and continue to write as I, I know you've got some articles uh, in the pipeline and coming out and try and educate the public as, as much as possible. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm also tremendously grateful uh, to you for joining uh, and may I take this opportunity to commend to you uh, 
uh, the International Law of Armed Conflict Gaza booklet uh, that UKLFI have prepared uh, in cooperation with Stand With Us, uh, a legal booklet which addresses the key considerations uh, and the questions and answers. It, it provides in that context basic uh, information and resources to be able to refute many of the wrongful allegations uh, and widespread um, uh, accusations of you know, systematic violations of international law uh, and we'll be circulating that booklet uh, again to you audience members uh, of this webinar. John, it's been enlightening as ever. Uh, thank you uh, for your time, especially on a Sunday and your energy and your commitment to telling the truth. I know that it will empower others to call out the falsehoods here. So I'm extremely grateful to you. Uh, and I can see in terms of the comments from the audience, they are very much also. Thank you so much, Natasha. Thank you for what you do. And that book looks amazing. Uh, I'll be sure to read it myself.